All right, so in the previous video, we talked about reading in a data set from a tabular text file. In particular, we worked with a CSV file. So we had a CSV file and we worked, to be more specific, with the iris data set. So we read in an iris data set from a CSV file, a comma separated value file, into a pandas data frame. Now, in this video, we are going to talk about how we can get the data into the right shape for machine learning with scikit-learn. So we will be talking about basic data handling using pandas and numpy to get the data into the right format for machine learning. So, but before we do that, let me briefly recap a basic concept about Python functions because it will become handy when we talk about transforming values in a pandas data frame. So here, that is a very simple Python function, which I not very creatively called sumfunc. And it takes one input argument, x, and it converts this input argument into a string and concatenates it with the yeah, fixed string, hello world. So if our input is an integer here, the integer one, two, three, this one gets converted to a string. So it will go get converted to a string so string one two three which is basically one two three as a string and this gets concatenated with hello world so it will yield this whole string here and that is just an outline of how a python function works we have this def here a colon and then a return statement and there could be an arbitrary number of lines be before the return statement for example now um, there is also a concept called lambda functions and <laughs> lambda functions is just more like a concept for lazy people who um, want to save some lines of code and write a function a little bit more quickly if it's a very short function like this function which is super short and if some people find this is too much work you can do this on one line so you can use lambda here lambda in a way acts similarly to the definition here um, so here we are setting up this function um, with one argument you can have an arbitrary number of arguments similar like you can have an arbitrary number of arguments here and then it's ex uh, exactly like this part here so there's nothing really useful or cool about lambda functions it's just a slightly shorter way of writing a function and then you can call the function and it does the same thing basically so I'm showing you this because it's very commonly used in the context of certain pandas um, data transformations on columns. So recall in the previous lecture, what we had is we read in the pandas data frame um, from the iris csv file. So we read in the iris, iris data into a pandas data frame. So the iris data set looked like this, that we had 150 rows. So here I'm only showing the first five months and we had some id column which is actually not important and then we had the features so usually we use the design matrix x for the features to talk about features the feature values and then we had our class labels so the, this is um, we usually call it y these are our class labels traditionally scikit-learn and other libraries um, didn't handle string variables as class labels well. So traditionally it was better to convert them to integers. So for example, converting Setosa, Iris Setosa to the integer zero, um, Iris um, Versicolor to the integer one, Iris Beginica to the integer two and so forth. So there is no ordering here. It's just like um, just using a number instead of a string, but the order really doesn't matter whether Setosa is zero or one or two if we do it consistently. It's just the way that um, many algorithms, when they were developed, they work with integer class labels, not with string class labels. And um, scikit-learn nowadays, it supports string class labels in most uh, functions. So you don't really have to do this conversion. It's doing the conversion internally. However, there are many tools that you may be using in your career later on where the developers um, don't have this transformation and don't particularly uh, develop the code for handling string data. So in that way, I um, usually, first of all, I would recommend reading the documentation, um, how they kind of recommend what uh, how the data set look, looks like or should look like. But then usually most of the time, it's um, safer to just use integer class labels, just like, 
uh, more tools are compatible with that. So you are more, uh, or you're less likely to bump into errors if you convert your class labels into integers. So here I will briefly explain how we do that. And that goes also back to the Lambda function. Because when um, sometimes when people do that, you often see a Lambda function in connection with an apply method called on a pandas data frame column. So what we are going to do now is we are going to convert this um, this column here, the species column, into an integer column. So we are referring to this species column, which is a string column, and then we call apply, which um, will iterate over the column. So it will, you know, if I, sorry, if I go back, let me use the color green now. So it will start here and then do a certain operation on this one, and then we'll go to the next, do the same operation or call the same function here and so forth. So it's just a way of calling a function all these values here. It's not particularly fast. It's kind of almost like a for loop on on a column. Anyways, it's just very convenient to do that because it can be done in one line of code. So this is also why people prefer using a lambda function in this context. However, you could also define the function by yourself. You can define the function like, an, I don't know, something like transform or something and then put some x here and then um, let's say if x equals zero then return oh sorry if x should so you want to do it the other way around if x equals iris setosa then return zero else return the original x so basically otherwise do nothing we could also have else ifs in between so this function will only convert iris setosa to zero and for iris virginica and iris versicolor it will not do anything however we could expand this function we could say if um, x equals iris setosa return zero else if x equals iris versicolor return one else return two and then we would handle all the three cases but this is just a simple illustration um, so instead of writing this function and then putting a transform into the apply method here we can also define that all in one line using this lambda here there's not a really a big advantage of using a lambda function it's just it's more concise maybe some people are too lazy to define the function here and that way you can do everything on one line um, yeah and also kind of it signals so we're not giving this function name it signals that we will in our code never use the function again so it's like a throwaway function whereas if we define a function it kind of may indicate that we want to reuse the function later on or it's just more code and maybe maybe a little bit more harder to read because someone may be curious ah, is this function useful later on and maybe not and then people would have to read the whole code and stuff like that and with the lambda function maybe just a little bit shorter but in any case, so what this function will be doing is, is just converting iris setosa um, labels from the previous column here. So where we had iris setosa, it will convert these um, to zero. So these will become zero. And so we have all these set to zero now, which you can see here. This is one way we can convert um, string label to an integer label. However, in practice, I don't think this is a great idea to do that. I'm just trying to explain how Lambda and apply work. So in case in the future you bump into them, if you read some code examples and you see someone uses apply and Lambda, you know how it works and how you can understand what it does. However, in practice for the class label transformation, I would rather recommend um, using a mapping dictionary. So here it's also kind of easier to understand or read what's going on if someone asks you later what is the class label zero, then you can say, ah, this is Iris Satosa because it, it's mapped here to zero. So in that way, you also can see more easily what the transformation is later on if you if someone asks you about that. So here, what I'm doing now, I'm, I'm defining a mapping dictionary. Um, Iris Satosa should be mapped to zero, Iris Versicala should be mapped to one, and Iris Virginica should be mapped to two. However, it doesn't really matter. I could also choose a different order. I could. 
um, say, I don't know, 210 or whatever I like. However, also a good practice is to use integer labels starting at zero. So we would use zero, one, two, if we have more label, uh, class labels like three and so forth until uh, yeah, all the possible class labels, let's say we have n possible class labels. So you would have them all enumerated like that without gaps because there's also, I mean, it depends on the software, but there are also some limitations that um, most tools assume that class labels start at zero. And in that way, um, it's easier to avoid bugs or unwanted behavior by um, yeah, encoding the class labels starting at zero and consecutively, not skipping any integer. And also, if you have a binary class label, um, in many textbooks, um, for example, um, I'm teaching that in my other class, the perceptron algorithm, there are algorithms that were traditionally developed how, in, in case how the mathematics work for class labels minus one and one if you have a binary classification problem. However, modern tools or modern implementations for consistency um, also kind of expect you to have integer labels like zero and one instead of minus one and one. So usually, again, I recommend reading the documentation of a tool that you are using. Um, but by default, if you use scikit-learn or other tools that are related to scikit-learn, it's most of the time zero and one that is expected for binary classification. Anyway, I'm getting distracted here. So let's go back to the map function. So here I'm just reading in the data set again, just to reset it because I already transformed it on the previous slide. So to reset it onto to the original state, I'm just reading it in here again. And then instead of using apply, I'm using map here. So map will um, yeah, convert the string labels into the integers by mapping um, very similarly to the apply function, mapping what it finds in the species column to the corresponding um, to the corresponding integer. Also, by the way, later on, if you want to get your original class labels back, you can define a reverse um, dictionary. You can, for example, say D reverse or something like that and set it the other way around. You can say zero equals um, iris Setosa one equals iris um, versicolor and two equals iris or well not equals but is set to iris virginica and then once you have your data set transformed like that what you can do is you can then call the map function with a reverse dictionary and it will then transform them back to the original class label. Yeah, so in the previous slide I was just showing you the first five rows. You could only see the um, Setosa flowers that were transformed because Setosa is um, usually if you don't shuffle the data set in Iris it comes first. Just to sh uh, show you that it also yeah handled the other flowers. So you can see for the last five using the tail command that it also transformed them into the corresponding class table. So the last 50 rows are Iris um, Virginica. Iris Virginica was class level two. So the last 50 rows here, I'm only showing you the last five, were also transformed. And correspondingly also the rows in the middle, which were Iris Versicolor. So here I'm showing you another concept um, that is using the values attribute. I think I mentioned that um, before when I talked about pandas. So if you call dot values, it will access the underlying NumPy array. So there's a NumPy underlying this column here, the species column, and by calling values, it will access the NumPy array. And also traditionally, scikit-learn and many, many other machine learning um, tools work with NumPy arrays, not pandas data frames. However, also nowadays, many algorithms support pandas data frames directly, but again, um, yeah, for tradition's sake or just to kind of avoid unwanted behavior if let's say the API is not um, super sophisticated of so, some uh, third-party tools that are not scikit-learn, I still recommend yeah, using NumPy arrays because usually it's also a little bit faster. It has a smaller memory footprint and stuff. So um, yeah, here you can see how the underlying um, NumPy array looks like the NumPy array underlying this pandas data frame column. So here you, yeah, you can see the first 50 flowers are the iris Setosa flowers, flowers converted to zero, or I mean the class label was converted to zero. Then you have the second 50 corresponding to the um, versicolor flowers and the last 
50, oops, the last 50 here, corresponding to the Virginica uh, flaws um, converted to the class table 2. Yeah, now we have our class table array, and like I mentioned before, we usually refer to our class table array as Y. So Y is usually our class label array. It's just a convention in Python to use the letter Y to refer to the class label vector or array. And we use capital X to refer to the feature. So what we call in the introductory uh, introduction, uh, what we call design matrix. Oops. If I touch the surface of my iPad with the finger, sometimes it jumps to the next slide, which is sometimes annoying. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So here at the bottom, what happens is I'm now extracting X, the design matrix or the features that we will be using for training our machine learning algorithm at the end of this lecture. So for that, I'm using the iLock method on, on pandas. So there are multiple ways we can do that. We can also take the names of the columns and um, put them in there. However, I prefer, I mean, not always, but here, because it's just such a small data frame, if you go here, I could type all these names of these columns in there, but it would be, for me, too much work, uh, too much typing. So, and because it's such a simple um, data frame where we only have um, one, two, three, four, five, six columns, we know that the columns one, two, five are the feature columns, so we can just use the i log. Um, I log uh, means index location. So it goes by this index, column index, um, and then we can slice it. So we say all the rows, that's similar to NumPy when we have the selection. So the first is for the rows and the second one is for the second axis, which are the columns. So we are selecting all rows because we want the whole data set, all the training data uh, examples. And then we only select columns, columns, oops, one, to five, which basically correspond, like I said before, um, so I can't go back. Oh, no, I, no, it works. Sorry. So which correspond to those here. Okay. So now we have both our label array and our X array here. I'm only showing the first five because otherwise it wouldn't fit. So the label, uh, sorry, the feature array looks like that. So also note, um, class label arrays are integer. So we have an integer array here. And um, the features are, in this case, of float values. That's also what scikit-learn expects. So we have floats, so decimal point numbers or real values. Oh, before I go to the next slide, I just see I put a little question here. Why did I put um, creating in quotation marks here? So why did I put that in quotation marks? Maybe a question for Piazza. So maybe have a discussion on that. <laughs> we can discuss that then on Piazza. Yeah, um, an additional tool that I wanted to mention um, is ML Extend. That is a library that I created long time ago, I think like in 2012, 2013, if not earlier. And here I put all the stuff in that I use yeah, in my day-to-day -day data science machine learning workflows and that I couldn't find implemented anywhere else at that time when I wrote them. So in, the, in a way, these are most of the time convenience functions, there are some uh, machine learning algorithms that are not implemented um, elsewhere in Python or they are in implemented in a way that, are, that I, let's say, didn't or couldn't use in my projects. So it's just a library that collects different things related to data science and machine learning. Most of the stuff is compatible to scikit-learn also. Anyways, uh, why mentioning it is, um, for example, one aspect um, that is Kind of useful is the scatter plot matrix. So usually when I work with a new data set, I make a scatter plot matrix to just take a look at it and how it looks like. It's you may you, uh, know that from R. It's just a very useful, simple way of yeah looking at a data set in the context of exploratory data analysis. And um, how that works is as follows. So I have now my feature array, my NumPy feature array. And then I'm creating a scatter plot matrix for only the Setosa uh, flowers, then only for the Virginica flowers, sorry, this Versicolor, and then for the Virginica flowers. So this is um, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. 
and um, yeah, I'm using the columns here as the names for sepal length, sepal width, and then same for petal length and petal width. So I'm just providing them here as the axes names. I'm just extracting them from the data frame because I was not too lazy to type them. Um, and here is some legend with the class labels. So this is in the same order as this one here, basically. And it will create three scatter plots or scatter plot matrices um, overlaid to, uh, with each other. The reason why they are overlaid is so that I can uh, basically show all the classes separately. I could also plot everything with one function call, so I can actually ignore these two here, and then it will only make, so if I ignore the last two rows, it will only make one scatter plot for the whole data set if I, instead of, um, instead of doing x, y equals zero, so only selecting Satosa flowers, I could just say x, and then we'll comp uh, plot the complete data set. However, then everything would be in the same color and I wouldn't be able to see which one is Setosa, which is uh, Versicolor, and which is Virginica. So if you don't have class labels, uh, if you have a data set and you want to take a look at it, you don't have to do it like multiple times. You can just use a single scatterplot matrix. Anyways, uh, talking so much now about the scatterplot matrix, how it's created, let's just take a look at it, how it looks like. So I couldn't unfortunately fit it into the previous slide because there was not, not much space left. But yeah, this is how it would look like. And yeah, I always find it useful to take a look at a data set before I work with it, given that it is in a reasonable size and not too large. So here, for example, by looking at it, I could um, yeah, take a look at outliers and just get an idea of how the data set looks like. So I can, for example, see that based on the petal length, I can already, with a very simple classification rule on, based on one feature, I can say if my petal length is, let's say, um, if it's bigger than, or let's say if it's smaller than 2.2 centimeters, then um, then it's the blue one, which is Setosa. So in this case, we can classify this Setosa with a very simple decision rule here. For Virginica and Versicolor, I can almost do the same thing with, I don't know, what is it, five centimeters? It's a little bit tricky. There's some overlap, so it's not quite as easy. So maybe some other additional feature column would be useful. So here I would have the petal width. It's kind of similar. You can use the petal width to yeah, separate between Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. But yeah, it's also not so clean. So maybe using both is a little bit better. So having a classifier that splits on both, both of them. And you can also see yeah, sepal length and sepal width are kind of less useful than petal length and petal width because here you can see there's more overlap. And of course, yeah, this is a very simple data set so we can take a look at it. But you can only take a look at two features at a time so it's not like super useful if you have a high dimensional data set because you would have to have a lot of features to look at in a high dimensional data set. But I still kind of like doing that. I mean, I just like looking at the data and see if there's maybe some outlier. For example, here, there's maybe a small outlier. Here, they are all nicely grouped together and stuff like that. And so I usually find it kind of interesting to, to uh, take a look at the data set before I work with it further. Yeah, now that we have the feature array X and the class table array why we can divide that up into a training, validation, and test set. So uh, first we write everything into X, but now let's divide it into a train, validation, and test set. So we will be using the concepts from the NumPy lecture where we talked about the random state. So what I'm doing first is I'm creating an index array here. So I'm taking the length of X, so X dot shape zero will give me the length of the array, uh, the length of the first index, uh, sorry, the first axis. So that would be the number of training examples. So, so that's the number of rows, right? Because X is uh, 150 times um, four dimensional array. So the shape is 150 comma four, it's a tuple. First value is the number of rows. So and the number of rows is the number of training examples. And what we do here is we create an index array starting at zero. So at the index array we create here with a range will be zero, one, two, 
three, four, and so forth. And then you use a random state, so it's reproducible. So later on, if we want to run the code again, it will um, create the same splits um, when we split the data. Um, so and then what we do is, so we have the label array, zero, one, two, three, four. We call uh, dot, uh, so on the random state, the dot permutation method, which will essentially shuffle the index array. So now we have a shuffled index array. The numbers here are from 0 to 150, but now it's shuffled. So why are we shuffling that? Because we can now use that to select the training set, um, validation set, and test set. So now we are going to use the shuffled indices to divide the data center training, validation, and test subsets. So just for a reference, this column here was from the previous slide, so we can just see it again um, for reference where the permuted indices come from. And then what I'm doing here is I'm uh, saying 50% of the data is going to the training set and 15% of the data, not overlapping with any of the data in the 65% here, goes to the validation here. So what I'm doing is I'm um, multiplying 0 0.65 with the length of the array. So I'm basically saying 0 0.65 times 150. This is the number of training examples. Uh, and this is the number of validation examples. And then the remainder would be the um, number of test examples. So we have 20% for test, that's the remainder. So the test size, I'm setting it here. So the length minus the size of the training set and validation set. So the remaining 20% will be for testing. So here I'm just getting the sizes for each subset. You can see 97 training examples, 22 validation examples and 31 test examples. And then I'm using my permuted indices that I created on the previous slide where I had the values 0 to 155 shuffled. I'm using that as a selection mask to select the training um, examples from the array. But first um, I'm selecting them from the permuted indices. So I'm getting yeah, the indices of the array corresponding to the training one. So 65% of the data or of the indices, that's the 15%, that's the 20%. So I'm just selecting here basically. So here I'm selecting everything up to train size, so everything up to 97, so zero to 97. And then here it's going from 97 to, um, 97 plus 22, which is 129, right? So we have 90, 97 to 129. And then for the last one, we have 129 to the end, which is essentially 150. So now I have my indices and then I can select correspondingly the training and uh, the training examples from the feature array and the corresponding class labels. So here, see I'm um, using that or these shuffled indices here. I'm using these here to select from the original one, the training examples. So the features from X and the corresponding labels. And I'm doing that um, also for the validation data set and the test set. So I have a test set now. So this is my, oh, sorry, this is my training set, a validation set, and also my test set. And by the way, this one um, came from, actually not sure where it came from. It shouldn't be here. Some, something left over. Okay, uh, but this is, uh, I would say a lot of steps. So I will show you later a more convenient way of doing that. So later I will show you also how we can do that more conveniently in scikit-learn. But I think it's kind of an important to understand how we would manually create training sets and validation sets and um, test sets just using NumPy, because in a sense, this is also what scikit-learn does under the hood. However, they provide one simple function for doing that where we did that manually here. So kind of looking over this and reading through this is also a good exercise for yeah understanding NumPy.
Yeah, so this is it for this video. So we talked about converting string class labels into integer class labels. We call, uh, talked briefly about the lambda functions, apply and map, uh, which are convenient in pandas when we do such transformations. And then we talked about how we can divide a data set into a training, validation and test set. So in the next lecture, we will, or in the next video, we will be talking about some basic object oriented programming um, yeah, concepts and Python classes, because that will be useful for understanding how scikit-learn works, which we'll be also talking in this lecture.